In the last several videos, we've been looking at an example from heat transfer that results in an ordinary differential equation, and we showed how we can convert that second order linear ordinary differential equation into a tridiagonal system of linear algebraic equations that we could then solve using the Thomas algorithm. Our primary focus, however, is to develop numerical methods using finite difference approaches to solve partial differential equations. And in preparation for that, in this video and the next, we're going to talk about how we can classify second order partial differential equations based on the type of the equation and the types of solutions that result. We'll have elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic equations. And first, in this video, I'm going to show where that classification comes from. In the next video, we'll talk about each of those three different types of equations, their mathematical characteristics, which we have to take into account when we develop numerical methods to solve them. So let's start with a general second order partial differential equation for function u as a function of the independent variables x and y. So it's a two-dimensional partial differential equation. The subscripts here indicate partial differentiation. So uxx is partial squared u, partial x squared. uxy is partial squared u, partial x, partial y, and so forth. Then the coefficients are a, b, c on the second derivative terms, d, e on the first derivative terms in x and y, and then we have the zeroth derivative term f times u as well as the right hand side function with g. Now such equation will be linear or nonlinear depending on the nature of the a, b, c, d, e, f coefficients. In particular, if the coefficients a, b, c, d, e, and f are only functions of the independent variables x and y and not the dependent variable u, then the equation is linear. It's fully nonlinear if the a, b, c, d, e, and f are functions not only of x and y, the independent variables, but also u and its derivatives, first and second order derivatives. In that case, we'd have a nonlinear partial differential equation. Now, if the coefficients a, b, c, d, e, and f are only nonlinear because of u and first derivatives in those a, b, c, d, e, f coefficients, so in other words, there's no second derivatives of u in the a, b, c, d, e, f coefficients, then we call it quasi-linear. Strictly speaking, it's still nonlinear, but we call it quasi-linear, quasi meaning almost. Now what we'd like to do mathematically is to determine in a domain which is governed by such a second order partial differential equation, how can we identify the paths, the curves along which the solution propagates in that particular domain depending on the type of equation, the mathematical classification of the equation that we have. That's what we want to look at. So let's think about a criteria that would be necessary for the existence of a smooth, in other words differentiable, and unique, in other words single valued, solution along some arbitrary curve C. We're going to express this curve C in parametric form, x is a function of tau, where tau is along that curve C. So again, we're looking for a criteria for which we have smooth, solutions that are unique. So differentiable and single valued along that curve. Now I want to write this in a matrix form. So to do so, let's write the second order derivatives in terms of these functions phi1, phi2, and phi3 of tau, and the first derivatives in terms of psi1 and psi2 of tau. So you'll see in the next slide how that enables me to write this as a system of equations. So in terms of these new variables, the phi's and the size, let's rewrite our second order partial differential equation. So it'll be a times phi one plus b times phi two plus c times phi three. And we're gonna put everything else on the right hand side. So the g term, as well as the first derivative terms and the zeroth derivative term, I'm gonna put all on the right side. So the only thing left on the left side is going to be these second derivatives, the uxx, the uxy, and the uyy terms. And collectively, we'll call all of this on the right-hand side, we'll call that H, capital H. Now, if we're going to do a transformation from one coordinate system to another, in this case from the two-dimensional coordinates x and y, to the parametric coordinate tau, we would need an expression for dd tau, a transformation law, which comes from the chain rule of calculus. So dd tau, where we have a function of both x and y, is going to be dx d tau partial partial x, plus dy d tau partial partial y. So that's just the chain rule for a transformation from x, y to tau. So then from our earlier definitions, if I apply d d tau, which we've just expressed here in the chain rule, of psi one, then we're gonna have d d tau of u sub x because psi one is u sub x. So that'll be dx d tau times u x x plus dy d tau u x y. But u x x, that's phi one, 
in uxy? Well, that's phi2. So we have d psi1 d tau, going to be expressed as dx d tau times phi1 plus dy d tau times phi2. Now you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment. Let's do the same thing, d d tau, but now of psi2. Psi2 is partial u partial y, so we have d d tau of u sub y. So that's dx d tau times u x y plus dy d tau times u y y. But again, u x y, that's phi2, and u y y, that's phi3. So if I look at these three equations, I have three equations for my three unknowns, phi1, phi2, and phi3. Remember, those are the second derivatives, uxx, uxy, and uyy. So those will be my solution vector, phi1, phi2, phi3, those second derivatives. From 4.3, we have a times phi1 plus b times phi2 plus c times phi3 is equal to h. The right-hand side, that includes the right-hand side function g plus the first derivatives and the zeroth order derivatives. Then this equation, we have dx d tau here times phi1 plus dy d tau times phi2, dy d tau times phi2 is equal to d psi1 d tau, d psi1 d tau. And then similarly in the third equation we have this. So it's dx d tau times phi2 right here. So dx d tau times phi2 and dy d tau times phi3, dy d tau times phi3. And of course there's nothing times phi1. And that's equal to d psi 2 d tau. So again, a 3 by 3 matrix problem for these second derivatives, the highest order derivatives in our partial differential equation. Now let's think about what would have to be true in order for there to be a unique solution to our system of equations, again, for these second derivatives. Well, notice this is a non-homogeneous equation. So the solution of a non-homogeneous system of equations will be unique if the inverse of the coefficient matrix does exist. In other words, it has a non-zero determinant. If it has a non-zero determinant, we can invert, in this case, the three by three matrix, multiply by the right-hand side vector, and get the unique solution for here, phi one, phi two, and phi three. Now we want actually the opposite. We're looking for situations where we do not get a unique solution for the system of equations. These are called characteristics of the equation. They represent discontinuities in the solution, so things aren't smooth, so we'd like the opposite situation to occur. In other words, we do not want a unique solution, so that will be the case if the determinant of our three by three matrix is actually equal to zero. And that's discussed on this next slide. So if I take the determinant, I won't go back and forth, but if you look at that three by three matrix, take the determinant, I'll have a times the square of dy d tau, plus c times the square of dx d tau, minus b times dx d tau times dy d tau. That's the determinant. We can go back and check that, and that has to be equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, then we have a discontinuity in the solution. It's not smooth, and those will represent these characteristics that I'm talking about. Now we can rewrite this equation if we multiply by the square of d tau dx. And notice what happens. I'll have a times the square of dy dx minus b times dy dx plus c is equal to zero. And now you'll notice we have a quadratic equation for dy dx. Well, what's dy dx? dy dx is the slope, rise over run, of this curve c. So if we were to solve for dy dx, we'd be solving for the slope. And of course, because it's a quadratic, we can use the quadratic formula. So dy dx is just equal to b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Quadratic formula applied to our quadratic equation for the slope dy dx of our characteristic curves c. And once again, these are curves along which our second order derivatives, the uxx, uxy, and uyy, are discontinuous. So we do not have a unique smooth solution along these characteristics. Now the nature of these characteristics that I'm talking about, these curves, depend on the nature of the slopes. Notice we have a plus or minus. So in general, we would have two factors, two roots of our equation. And the nature of those roots depend on the b squared minus 4ac. Because it's in the square root, if b squared minus 4ac is positive, then we have a square root of a positive number, and we have b plus or minus that positive number over two times a. If the b squared minus 4ac is negative, then the square root of that will give us an imaginary number, in which case we have complex characteristics. 
Or the third possibility is if the b squared minus 4ac were happened to be equal to zero, then this term goes away and we simply have b over 2a. So there's three possibilities. So if b squared minus 4ac is positive, we get two real roots and that corresponds to two characteristics. So two curves within the domain along which formation is propagating through the domain. Those are called hyperbolic partial differential equations. If b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero, then there's only one real root, so one characteristic, and that's a parabolic partial differential equation. If b squared minus 4ac is negative, so then the square root of a negative number is imaginary, so we don't have any real roots, only complex roots, and so therefore there are no characteristics, and that's called an elliptic partial differential equation. So physically, again, the characteristics are curves along which information propagates. And that's the important thing we need to know about this mathematical classification that's gonna carry over into the numerical solution techniques. Our numerical solution techniques have to be faithful to, adhere to the mathematical nature of these solutions. So information can propagate through our numerical domains in a way consistent with the mathematical domains. You'll notice that the classification only depends on the coefficients of the highest order derivatives, the a, the b, and the c, not the lower order derivatives. The terminology hyperbolic parabolic elliptic sounds familiar. It sounds like the conic curves, conic sections that we learn about in calculus for algebraic equations of this form. And so that's where the terminology comes from. And, and that's all, there, there's no carryover in terms of our intuition or the shapes of things. This is just where the terminology comes from, hyperbolic parabolic and elliptic. Now one good thing is later on we're going to talk about how we can transform our governing equations from one coordinate system to another, usually for convenience in getting the numerical solution. And in terms of the mathematical classification, it turns out that will not change the classification, the type of equation we're dealing with. If we have an elliptic equation in a particular curvilinear coordinate system and we transform to another curvilinear coordinate system, it will still be elliptic. So the character of the equations will not change under transformations from one curvilinear coordinate system to another. Now in the next video, we're gonna look specifically at hyperbolic, parabolic, and elliptic PDEs. We'll take a look at a standard canonical differential equation that exemplifies the type of behavior in each of these three types of equations. I'll show you what these characteristics look like in each of the three cases and then that will form the basis for then the numerical methods that we'll develop for these three different types of PDEs.